Today I'm sitting down and talking with a very special guest. I'm talking with my friend and fellow YouTuber Josh from Keep It Tiggy. Josh, how are you doing today? How you doing, DT? I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I've been wanting to get you on the channel for a little while. I know I've asked you a couple of times and you've sent me messages before. And it seems like when we message each other, it's always before. It's always been on Patreon. And I know you don't check your messages that often on Patreon and I don't check mine, you know, like every few days, sometimes I'll go a week or two without checking messages. And a lot of times these messages just get lost because if you get a lot of messages, you know, sometimes things go by and I'm really bad at checking my emails as well. <laughs> so I know that's part of the problem that it's taken so long for us to do this, but I'm glad you could be here today. So uh, tell my viewers a little bit about yourself. So. Um, how you guys doing? I'm Josh from Keep It Techie, and uh, I have a Linux YouTube channel, and I cover various Linux topics, and I also uh, do a little bit of mentorship to help people get into the IT field. Uh, I've been working in the IT field for over 15 years, and I've worked in different positions, network administrator, systems administrator. And Linux has always been a hobby that I've done outside of my normal work schedule. And I've always had Linux servers set up um, where I just set up various services, whether it's uh, websites or just different tools that I use, backup tools that I would use at the house. And it's always just been somewhat of a passion that I would play around with on the outside of my job. <laughs> no. Well, when did you actually switch to Linux on the desktop? I'm assuming you're running Linux as your main operating system or are you on Windows or Mac? Yes, I'm using Linux. Uh, nice. I've been using Linux uh, since around 2015-ish. Um, it, it was on and off. I used it before that. Um, but then I went back to Windows for a little while, and then I switched back in 2015. So you could say that's the kind of official time period where I fully immersed myself in the Linux experience on my own desktops at the house. Uh, what uh, distribution did you run as a first desktop distribution? Now, I started off with Ubuntu, and that's probably a lot of people's similar story. They start off with Ubuntu because mm. that's the most popular well, Linux yeah, distro. Yeah. <laughs> especially in the, that time period you're talking about, Ubuntu uh, with the Unity desktop at the time was, was starting to get really good. So that would make sense. Yeah. Because that was uh, really after they got a lot of the bugs worked out with Unity, like with 1404 and 1604. I think those were really some of the best versions of Ubuntu that they ever put out. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. Uh, those were, well, I was new to it, so I was still learning. So I didn't know uh, all the ins and outs of the different, you know, desktop environments. And trust me, um, your channel, I believe, and as well as Joe Collins' channel, uh, mm -hmm. I know you know him uh, yeah. as well, um, really helped me you know, get a good understanding of Linux in order to to learn a lot more. So, well, well that's really cool. Uh, you, you're not running Ubuntu now, are you? Are you still on it? Or have you, nah, you probably hopped a million times since oh, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. I don't remember exactly when it was, but I know I um, I heard about Orch Linux, and I know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I, I, I mentioned this on camera. Uh, I, I did a video about three years ago. I said, so many people take the path of Ubuntu and then Arch. Like it's, <laughs> there's no in between. They try Ubuntu and it's like, okay, Linux is pretty easy. And then they go straight to Arch from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, I took steps uh, in yep. order to get to Arch Linux. Like I didn't go right to Arch. I didn't try out the installer right off. I was looking for an easier way. Cause like I said, I was, I, I wasn't that deep into understanding it a hundred percent. Cause all I ever worked with was windows systems, you know, outside right. of it. And so uh, I was still learning. So I took steps to get over. So I didn't just hop right over to Arch. I, uh, no. I actually started that off with Interagos. I don't know yeah. if you remember that distro when they when they came. Yeah. Well, it's that's funny because that distribution has died and been reborn like three different times. It actually started out as Cinarch, 
which was a cinnamon desktop version of Arch. And then they rebranded it to Entergos. And then that died, and it was rebranded as Endeavor. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it has a long history. It's just been under three different names. But it's been around probably at least a decade. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that helped me transition. I I tried it out in a virtual machine and then said, well, this is easy enough. Let me go down and um, try Antergos or Antergos. I'm sorry. Uh, but I tried that. I have no idea how it's supposed to be pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I um, tried it on my main system, you know, tested it out, figured out the package manager. And I said, hey, well, uh, over time, I said, hey, well, let me go down and try Orange Linux. And this is one thing I always tell people uh, when you want to try a new distribution and similar to what you do on your channel. I mean, try it out in a virtual machine first and yeah. then, you know, at least go through the installer. And that's what I did with Orch. I went through the installer multiple times just to verify that I understood uh, what I ought to do with the system to get it up and running. And now we're fortunate now to have such amazing virtual machine technology that did not exist when I first switched to Linux. Like when I first switched to Linux, if I wanted to try out a new distribution, I had to hop to it. Yeah. Or if I wanted to try out a new desktop environment, I had to install the full desktop environment on my physical hardware. And if I didn't like it, I had to try to uninstall the whole thing. And it, especially in those days, you Gnome and KDE had weird conflicts and having both on the system was always a pain. So now, you know, people don't realize that these virtual machines, they're really like a godsend. <laughs> like you, you can try anything out in a virtual machine and you don't have to hose your physical machine. Exactly. I agree. I agree. Especially when you took time to configure a lot of things on the system. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely easier yeah. to just try it out that way. What kind of virtual machines do you like using? Are you using VirtualBox for the most part, VMware? Uh, I started off using VirtualBox a whole lot. That was the main virtualization software I would use. But then I eventually, because I've always had servers, like physical mm -hmm. servers, and not those Blade servers or anything. It was basically converting a desktop into a server. Oh, okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, and... um. But um, I said, hey, let me just go on and, um, and get me a legit server, so to speak. And so I, um, I got one from Dell. And so now I run Proxmox mm -hmm. and I do a lot of my virtualization there. So whenever I want to test out a new distro, I just do it on the, on the Proxmox server and just play around yeah. with it. Yeah, there. People have asked me about Proxmox. I've never looked at it. I probably should at some point. I probably should just throw it on like one of my digital ocean server, you know, cloud hosting or something, or actually I have this server rack uh, behind me. It's not in camera frame, but you've seen that five foot tall server rack that I've yeah. got mostly audio equipment in. I mean, I could you know, put a, a server on the rack mount just for VMs, mm -hmm. but that's a little overkill yeah. for virtual <laughs> machines. You know, just, that's why I got a small I, one. I, I yeah. just got a small desktop server from Dell and just, yeah, it's not too big. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, earlier you talked about your YouTube channel, and I've got to say, you got an excellent YouTube channel, really good information, both about desktop Linux and as well as uh, Linux on the server, IT system administrations, things like that. Uh, what, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is you make your content on Linux, right? You, you record and you do all the editing. What software are you using for your video production? Okay, so... The main software to record everything, I use OBS. Um, and I know a lot of people use that. You know, it's free and open source. You know, anybody. Can and it's become it. the standard, really. Mm -hmm. as, uh... Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, a lot of, uh, let's say, audio editing, I do use Audacity uh, mm -hmm. in order to correct certain things with the audio um, that I can't do in OBS. And then right. um, I typically use... Uh, Caden Live. I've been using Caden Lives from the beginning. So I've seen all the different iterations, <laughs> all the changes they have made, all the add-ons and all that stuff to to Caden yeah. Live. Caden Live, I think, is one of the best, you know, editing softwares out there. It opinion. really is a very powerful video editor for being free and open source software. Yeah. Uh, the one thing about it that I've always it makes me angry is the fact that it's free and open source software. It sees constant development. 
And it seems like every other version breaks something. <laughs> it's <laughs> like true. they'll break something this version, and then the next version, they'll fix what they broke the previous version, they'll break something else. It's like always. Uh, but, you know, it, it's got so many different cool effects and compositions. Like it really has everything you need in a video editor. And I know, obviously, professional video editors are going to talk about things like DaVinci Resolve, especially these days. It's kind of like the one everybody uses. But you also have things like Premiere Pro and Final Cut and things like that. But honestly, unless you need, especially with something like Premiere Pro with that subscription model for yeah. Adobe, you are throwing away potentially thousands of dollars over a number of years for stuff you're probably never going to need that's in Adobe Premiere Pro. Caden Live has got you covered for, for practically nothing. Obviously, you should donate to these guys. I love donating money uh, mm -hmm. to the KDE project every year around Christmas time. They typically do a, a fundraising drive. I try to throw KDE some money because that some of that money will go to development of Caden Live. I'm a Patreon subscriber actually of OBS because I couldn't do my work without them. So I try to throw those guys a few bucks as well. So, yeah, that's great that you're, you're doing a lot of open source software. What about a uh, artwork thumbnails? You use a uh, GIMP or Krita or I mainly use GIMP on a lot of my, now I have uh transitioned a little bit and start doing a few of the editing on a few, a little bit of the editing online uh, mm -hmm. using Canva. Um, and so I, I've heard of that. I've never tried it out, but I, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but I've heard other content creators mention that particular site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a pretty cool, uh, it, it helps with the workflow because mm -hmm. as you know, recording these videos and putting <laughs> out this content, and I heard you do this in the recent video, man, uh, -huh. uh the hours that it takes to put these, this content out for people yeah. is, it, it does take time, you know? Uh, Every little bit of time that you can save, if you can save five minutes from your normal workflow by changing up something, man, you got to do it because it, it does. It takes so much time. You got to learn all of, like the shortcuts and key bindings and Caden Live, even if it, it seems like it's just a minor improvement to your workflow. You got to do it because you know if you spend as much time in Caden Live as I do, you know you got to you got to learn the ins and outs. Same thing with something like GIMP, which is a very complicated program. Yes, it is. <laughs> it takes a long time. It took me, I've been a GIMP user, seriously, for about 20 years because I was okay. using GIMP before I switched to Linux, even, you know, even back on Windows. Um, but I can't say that I really knew how GIMP worked until about 10 years ago. <laughs> like it took me a long time to, because it's just so complicated with all the, the tools and the windows. And back then they had the multi-window thing where GIMP was like three windows oh, yeah. on the screen instead of just the one. Mm -hmm. And that was so confusing, especially coming from the Windows world. I'd never seen a program that had multiple windows open up like that. So. Yeah. And then one of the, I guess, um, see, I had a little bit of experience using um a the, the Adobe product uh, Photoshop. Um, Photoshop, yep. Yeah, which is equally as confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, just understanding a little bit of that kind of helped me. In They're all confusing. I mean, yeah. the, these kinds of pieces of software are not, like audio editing is not easy. It doesn't matter the program you use. Video editing is not easy. It doesn't matter the program you I talked about. Everybody uses DaVinci Resolve these days. DaVinci Resolve is complicated as hell. Like right, it's a steep it. learning. Yeah, right. So uh, <laughs> I gave up on it. I I I, I uninstalled it, man. I I tried. <laughs> I uninstalled it. I think I installed it once just to see if it worked on Linux because this was when they first made a Linux package. Now I knew you know proprietary software, and I was I, I like Caden Live, so I was going to stick with Caden Live. But I just wanted to see if I could get it installed. And it would it actually render a video? I think I did a test video at like 720p or something, and it did actually record correctly. So, but at the time, I think it had more to do with the uh, video card I was using because when they first switched to Linux, I can't remember. I think I was an NVIDIA user, and I think DaVinci Resolve only worked with NVIDIA and not AMD at the time. Now, of course, all of that's been worked out. But by the way, are you a team AMD or team NVIDIA? NVIDIA. Yeah. Yeah, NVIDIA. 
I think everybody objectively recognizes that NVIDIA is the better product, especially if you're going to use the proprietary video drivers like you should if you spend all that money on an NVIDIA card. But I, these days, I like being an AMD user just for the convenience of it being open source and the drivers are already in the kernel. Yes. There's so much. Yes. E I've, I've never had an issue with AMD or Intel, you know, because they open source all their drivers. The NVIDIA drivers can be a mess on Linux sometimes to mm -hmm. get them installed or sometimes you'll install the wrong one. And I'm sure you've done that before where you reboot a, a machine, you just get a black screen. Yes. And and you know it's the wrong video driver. Yep. <laughs> right? yep. Yep. Of, of course we know that, but a new user is going to think I just broke my machine. Mm -hmm. Right? They don't know. Uh, that's another thing that uh, scares away a lot of new users is these simple things that you know. With, if you've been around long enough, I I know immediately when Grub is broken, for example, or when yeah. the video driver is bad. But a new user, they don't know these things. And unfortunately, we still encounter these problems all the time on Linux because we were just having grub issues not too long ago. Uh, was it in Arch? I can't remember which distribution was having some major grub problems. I think it was Arch. I, it, Linux has, has gotten so much better, though, mm -hmm. compared to when when I started, when you started. When, wouldn't you agree with that? Or uh, what has changed since 2015? Um. The design of Linux, that's that's one of the biggest things that stands up. And what I mean yeah. by design is the um, the desktop environments, the improvements mm -hmm. on a lot of the different desktop environments, because I I haven't really got into window managers like you on your mm -hmm. channel. But the desktop environments have just greatly improved. And yes. it's, it's it makes it a lot easier for new people to get into Linux and yeah. really understand the desktop environment and, and take advantage of the things that are there. Yeah. That's one of the things I, I like. I think, uh, I think that's a really good observation actually, because especially when you, around the time you were starting 2015 on the desktop, GNOME and KDE are the mo by far the most popular desktop environments. Those are the two that most Linux users use and GNOME and KDE in 2015, were horrible yes, especially were. gnome gnome was straight trash in 2015 so but now the latest gnome version 45 that, I, I, that ubuntu just shipped with the new fedora is going to ship with here in a few days that thing is awesome yes it is. like it's it's incredibly good i would run it if i had to you know obviously we've got choice but i would have no problem running that where for the first 10 12 years of me running linux i would have never considered using GNOME. It would have been the last desktop environment I would have used. <laughs> it was that bad. So yeah, I, I, I agree that the desktop environments have gotten really, really good. And then you've got all the alternatives like a uh, budgie and cinnamon and things like that, that are, that are really sweet as well. Yeah. The choice is, is another thing. Like, so like you just pointed out to just having all those different choices and they all look pretty good, man. And, and you got quirks here and there in certain yeah. ones that you may not, you know, like, well, try another one. You know what I'm saying? And they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're all pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things I noticed on your YouTube channel, she focused a lot of on security issues regarding Linux, obviously, because of your job. You know, Linux is a real target as far as the server space for people you know, hacking and things like that. Yeah. So, but as a Linux desktop user, what do you think about uh, security? Is it because for as long as I've been using Linux on the desktop, we have always kind of been complacent saying that you know, nothing can ever really affect us. We don't need to run antivirus. You know, our machines are pretty much secure. We don't really have to go through any of these extra steps to, to harden our systems in any way. Uh, do you think that that's still the case or or what are your thoughts on that as far as a um, desktop user? I, I still think is is uh, that is still the case. I mean, we're starting to see a lot more um, malware and different things that are targeting the Linux desktop uh, mm -hmm. users because um, the and, and and all it's ever been was that Windows is the most popular you know, server and right. desktop that's used out there in the world. And so 
obviously these bad actors are going to target those systems. And so now they're starting to see a lot more IoT starting devices, to see. Yep. Uh, cloud, you know, servers out there, which they've always had cloud servers yeah. out there. They're, they're starting to tar- target uh, mobile operating systems, yes. especially. That yeah. too. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and, and we all know it's, <laughs> It's not seen in the forefront. It's kind of like in the background, but Linux is, has always been the dominant player in the background uh, in a lot of different areas. You know, well, the most popular operating system in the world is Android, yes, which runs yes, on exactly. which runs on a Linux kernel. So. Yes, exactly. It's, it's not GNU slash Linux like on our desktops. Mm-hmm. It's a completely different operating system, but the heart of it is still that same kernel. Yep, yep. And so people are starting to target that a lot more. And so... Um, that that like I I covered a while back. There was um some vulnerabilities, and they're being covered and talked about a lot more. You'll start seeing seeing it more in the news. Uh, where I, I've noticed a, a little bit of a unfairness with the way Linux vulnerabilities are covered in journalism, tech journalism, mm-hmm. because I think. There are, and this is not everybody, but there are some Windows fanboys out there that have never liked the way Windows had been portrayed as being a vulnerable operating system and that Linux and Mac and these other operating systems aren't that way. So now that more of these hackers are targeting Linux and Mac and Chrome OS, now they just love it. They want to bring up every single incident that happens. <laughs> no, nah, that's true. That's true. It's like the, uh, the shoes on the other foot. And so yeah, kinda... you, you, y'all talked all that trash for all them years. Now, now look what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is true. It, they do <laughs> kind of like prop those articles up a little bit mm-hmm. more. Um, well, they blow some that. of it way out of proportion. Yeah. Because they make it sound like, you know, it's the end times because uh-huh. of the latest kernel cr- attack or whatever. It's like, no. Like, it's already been patched by the time they put the article out there. Yeah, and that's one good thing about open source. A lot of times, these problems are found quickly, and they um, oh, release a patch yeah. pretty quick, you know? Like, not 95% of the time, by the time the news breaks, mm-hmm. it is already patched. Yep. And the big, especially the corporate distributions, like Ubuntu and Red Hat and things like that, they've already updated <laughs> they've yep. already pushed out the updates <laughs> so you're already fixed before you even knew about it mm-hmm. yeah. exactly uh, assuming you update your systems which is another thing that uh, especially desktop linux users some of them don't update at all which is kind of dangerous linux mint did a study uh, a few months back i remember they, they actually put out a blog post basically chastising their users because they realized that there were a, a, a significant percentage of Linux Mint users that were still using a version of Linux Mint like three versions back. Wow. You know, like they don't go to the, the latest version. Not only that, most of them are never going to the GUI software center and pushing the update button. They just don't have, they never update their system. Yeah. And, and they had to put out a blog post like, hey guys, you're doing it all wrong. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's dangerous. That is that is kind of dangerous. You need to go down and update your systems and stay on top of it. That's that's one thing I I, I don't know. I'll get um something in my head just pops up and say, Hey, you need to update your system. Yeah, but you you you've seen that in the server space because mm-hmm. I, I've known I've seen those people that have that Debian server that's been running for yeah. twelve years or whatever yeah, it's yeah. been <laughs> and they've never yeah. updated a thing. Yeah, yeah. updated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I guess that's the point. I mean, if you're looking for something rock solid, stable, you kind of have to not update. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's that's the trade off there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about a, a couple of big stories here in the past year. The first one I want to talk about is probably the biggest just general tech related story of the past year. And I think that's clearly the rise of A.I. Mm-hmm. And I personally think that A.I. is going to be a major disruptor. And a lot of different industries, a lot of jobs are going to be lost to AI and a lot of jobs will be created by AI. You know, it's going to really going to turn things a little upside down in various industries. How do you think AI is going to affect IT system administrations, things like that? Do you think it have any effect at all in any of the areas uh, that you deal with? One thing I've been saying, one thing I've been seeing, AI is um, mainly becoming a tool to make things a little bit easier. Now, yeah. like what you said earlier, um, 
some positions are going to be lost and they're going to be think about the help desk game. think about yeah. somebody that's just uh answering phone calls and, and giving help advice does that need to be a real person once ai is a little more mature i'm not sure I'm not sure that person has to exist anymore yeah it <laughs> see that's the thing <laughs> you know I, that's I try not to be doom and gloom about it uh, but yeah. um it could it could potentially assist, you know what I'm saying? Because you're seeing it nowadays with these uh bot telephone calls. I mean, that's that's AI. Well, right? I've mentioned you know, before AI. that I think AI actually would be better as far as public teaching than 99 percent of the teachers that actually teach in our public schools. Because you know, a lot of teachers are not good at their jobs, and I yeah I hate to just <laughs> paint everybody with that brush, but there's a lot of them that are just not good at their jobs, and I think in some cases. AI could actually be an improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing I, like I was looking at an article a while back as well, that uh, they're doing something similar in China. They're tracking and see, this goes into the whole privacy thing, which yeah. I don't know when you want to, if you want. Oh, we're going to get there. <laughs> I mean, let's go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. They're, they're tracking the students within the class. They have some type of technology they're putting on the kid's head to track if they're focused or not. Um, yeah. A lot of them make the kids now, uh, there's certain web browser plugins that they have to install that in Chrome or fire. I think it's usually Chromium based browsers, uh, but if you have to have a webcam on. And the webcam actually watches your eyes yep. to make sure you're actually watching that screen <laughs> and you're not looking over at whatever cheat yeah. sheet you have. <laughs> like it's just weird. Like Yeah, but yeah, AI is 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 here to stay, you know what I'm saying? And it's gonna be uh more involved in a lot of positions now, but I see it at least at my level as um, a way to make things a little bit run a little bit more efficient and not actually replace because you're still going to need that human element uh, to either troubleshoot or right. fix certain things. You know, Well, you can't replace everybody with yeah. a computer. You ha always have to have a, a, an actual real life human being somewhere because at the end of the day, someone has to be responsible Yes. Exactly. Like if everything goes wrong, you have to be able to blame somebody. And if it's all bots, all computers, you have nobody to blame. So even if it's just for the corporation to be able to scapegoat somebody, they have to have at least one person that they can yep. point the finger at and say it's his fault. <laughs> yep. And so the positions are going to be a little bit more specialized. So yeah. you're going to have to it's just not going to be your run of the mill programmer. You know what I'm saying? You got to specialize in something you have to be efficient in something it's, well that's going to become more competitive uh programming is a great uh example of an industry that won't be replaced by ai yeah. but it will be made better by it because an ai is not going to program something for you mm -hmm. it, it'll give you bits of code for specific action you want but it's kind of like if you're a novelist you know can you tell chat gpt to write you a novel Sure. Is it going to be any good? No. Right. Because it's not a, a human being. There, there's certain nuances, certain emotions you got to put into a, a artistic kind of thing like or writing or music. It's something that a computer can't do. So there's certain things that I I think programming is like that, even though a lot of people wouldn't say there's an artistic element to it. There's certainly more than what most people think. And I, I don't think just a, a computer you can tell it, hey, write me a program to do this, mm -hmm. and it's going to do it in a way, like when it comes to like UX, user experience, yeah. how would a computer know what a human user experience should look like? You know? Yep, it's that creativity, you know, portion or side of it that uh, that computer cannot do, you know, yeah. at least at this point. <laughs> you never well, know in yeah. the future. <laughs> well, you, you, who knows what what will happen in a few decades you're right yeah well I, again that that's probably the biggest story a tech related story of the past year was the the rise of ai because especially for the first three months of this year that's all anybody talked about yeah. but by far the biggest linux specific story of the past year of course has been red hat and it basically trying to close source some of its assets so that the 
Red Hat Enterprise Linux clones like Alma and Rocky and Oracle can't just make a straight one-to-one clone of their operating system. Of course, that saw a lot of backlash from users uh, in the Linux community, uh, mainly because a lot of users of Rocky Alma, you know, those guys are wondering, hey, what the hell is going to happen to our distribution? You know, and a lot of them are still mad about what happened with CentOS. Yeah. The CentOS was an extremely popular server distribution that Red Hat just yeah. put the axe down on. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? And as that particular decision by Red Hat, has that affected you in your work? Yeah, um, I think it's. Um, I think it's wrong. <laughs> Just overall, I mean, if you started off down that path of, you know, open source, don't close it out to to the world just on a whim. Uh, and yeah. it looks as though it's just it's just about money. You know, it is kind of weird to what, you know, I, I get you know, the money thing. But if you began as free and open source software, yeah, the whole point of any free and open source license is somebody can take your work and do whatever the hell they want with it. Have to rename it or whatever. You know, there might, there's some other things to the li- each license. But essentially, all of them grant somebody the ability to take that, fork it, and do something else with it. They, so it's weird now. We don't want people to be able to do this. Well, you, and you're not really an open source company yeah. if you don't think people should be able to do that. Yeah, and it's, it's because they... they I don't know if their share is going down as for market share is going down in any way, but they've always been heavy on the, you know, business side of things, you know what I'm saying? Offering support. And that's why a lot of organizations put their trust in Red Hat because of the support that they have. Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, well, it is interesting. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say what you said about uh, as far as market share, as far as uh, revenue, because obviously it's a public company. It's IBM now owns Red Hat. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, IBM, what did they pay for Red Hat? It was, I, I want to say it's 20 some odd billion dollars. Like yeah. they make money. Like it's yeah. not, they're not broke. Right. Mm-hmm. And I would argue that the people that are not using Red Hat Enterprise Linux on the server, if they w- were a CentOS user or going the uh, a Debian or Ubuntu route on the server, which a lot of people do. And they're not, they're not they were never going to use Red Hat Enterprise Linux anyway. Yep. You know, like the same thing with Rocky and Alma users. If they're using those to avoid paying for a Red Hat license, they were never going to pay for that license anyway. Even now, if mm-hmm. Alma and Rocky went away, they probably just spin up a Debian server, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're not going to exactly. they're not going to oh, okay, you got me. Let me pay my $50. No, they're not going to do that. Yeah, and one one thing you're starting to see though as well with this, um, they have to provide these images out to these cloud platforms. Um, they have to have a legit, you know, uh, yep. image up there, and so um, the GPL license yeah. demands mm-hmm. that anybody that wants the source code has to be able to ask you for it, and you provide it in some yep. way. Yep. Exactly. So you either have to have it public. On the internet, like on GitHub, GitLab, something like that, or still putting it out there on physical media, whether it be disk or tape or what, you know, going back before the days of the internet, that was still a legitimate way to abide by the license. But yeah, the G, uh, you're technically in legal trouble mm-hmm. if you license have something licensed under a free license and people can't get the source code from you. Yeah. And when like somebody problem- could sue you and yeah. you, you would be in trouble. Yeah. And one of the problems I'm seeing, uh, it, and this might affect the market share as well, but a lot of these cl- cloud platforms are basically taking Red Hat and creating their own Linux distribution. I just I just reviewed, um, what was that? Amazon Limit, Linux. It's a Red Hat yeah. clone. It's essentially the exact same thing as Red Hat. Mm-hmm. And so... Well, that's all Oracle is, which mm-hmm. I don't know why anybody would want to pay Oracle money instead of Red Hat. I, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay, let me not pay this devil and go pay this other one. Because <laughs> <Right. So, laughs> Oracle is definitely not a friend of open source. But yeah, I don't want to get off on that. I don't want to get off on that because oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but Amazon, they, I mean, they're, they're the biggest cloud platform, you know, in the world currently and so 
they're pushing their own Linux distro. You know what I'm saying? That's basically based on Red Hat. So I don't know. Now, going back to some of your work on servers and with IT and system administrations, things like that, uh, obviously, you most of the time don't have a desktop environment. You're doing a lot of things at the command line. And I have to ask, what is your favorite terminal text editor? Are you VI, Vim, Nano, Ed? (laughs) But to be honest, um, I've I've been using Nano. It's just been hard to get away from Nano. I I started out using Nano. (laughs) That was the first text editor I, I, I actually learned how to use or edit configuration files and different things like that is nano. So I'm just so used to using it. I just automatically type it without thinking about it. But um, VI and Vim, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're good. You know what I'm saying? They're good to use. It's just, I haven't been able to transition to them uh, to use them full time. (laughs) Well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I learned Vim, I think five, six years ago. So it's not like I've been using it forever, but I mean, have you ever, I'm sure you've probably run into a situation where you SSH into a machine or something, and, and the only editor on this thing is VI a yeah. lot of times. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes you end up stuck there. And I know before I really learned VI, mm-hmm. I had to use VI a lot. You know, like I, okay. every time I'd end up in it, okay, how do I move around? How do I quit the damn thing? <laughs> yeah, How do I add stuff to it? Uh, oh, right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I learned just enough to where I knew how to make an edit, a small edit, and get out. But yep. I never really learned how to, to use it until much later. And I kind of regretted after I learned it. Like, oh, this is kind of cool. <laughs> like, it's, I should have learned this before. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's that's one thing. I Like, I always see, like, I remember... Was that Luke Smith a long time ago? He would be doing all those with the key bindings and and different things. And uh, I was just overwhelmed. (laughs) The the cool thing with a well with VI, you can't you you can't play with it too much. But Vim, you -hmm. can heavily configure it. But even just stock Vim with no configuration, it's a pretty dang good text editor. So it's not Mm -hmm. like you know just. If you're on a server and all you've got is Vim straight out of the box, for example, it's actually a very comfortable text editor if you if you know how to navigate yeah. it. But but Nano, that, that's interesting. You, mm-hmm. You're very comfortable with Nano. I always found the key bindings in Nano confusing. Oh, okay. Because yeah. it, they're not like any other program, like the mm-hmm. weird like copy and paste and things. Yeah, and, and the cut. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 um, I don't know. It, see, I started off with ubuntu you know and yeah. nano was there always yeah they there. don't even install vim on a, a matter of fact i have filed that bug report <laughs> on camera many times about ubuntu you've probably seen me every time i install ubuntu whether it be the desktop or the server or whatever it happens to be i always talk about vim's not installed out of the box and htop's not installed out of yep. the box what are you doing ubuntu <laughs> like you got to have those two programs <laughs> yep yep a matter of fact, I complained about it enough that one of the uh, community editions of Ubuntu, I think it's the Lubuntu team. Oh, Lubuntu. They saw me complain about it enough. They added Vim and HTOP to there. Okay. Right? So, so, <laughs> so Lubuntu, you know, two thumbs up. Cool, cool. Now, another thing I, I did want to ask you, as a longtime Linux user at this point, you've been using Linux long enough that oh, everyone has a horror story. When it comes to Linux, whether you formatted the wrong disk, you deleted your root file system, things like that. What's the worst mistake that you've ever made on Linux? <laughs> oh, man, I'm going <laughs> to embarrass myself. But um, oh, I've, I've got some stories, so you're not yeah. going to be the only one. <laughs> I basically deleted. It, it's a sh- very short story, but I basically mm-hmm. ran. The, I was trying to. um I was trying to restore my home directory, I don't know, on a new system, and I just deleted the full operating system. Uh, I basically ran a move Uh, command. In the wrong direction? Yeah, in the wrong. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, yeah, it just started dying right in front of my eyes, and I started crying. (laughs) I've seen that with the DD command, because you've got the uh, input file and the output, and if you you mix them up. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I've I've had that happen with DD. Uh, I've had DD where you're writing to 
in most of my machines, I have multiple drives because I find I hate dual booting and partitioning a drive. I like every operating system to be on their own drive. But like in this machine, I've got six drives. Okay. So I've got SDA, SDB, and you know, it's really easy to not remember which drive is which and to format SDB when you really should have formatted SDC or whatever it happens to be. And then you realize I just wiped out something I really didn't mean to wipe out. Yeah. No, I've done that a few times. I deleted my entire home directory just a couple months back. Oh, man. On, on my home computer by accident. I did a RMRF, and I guess I didn't know where the hell I was in the, mm -hmm. the directory structure. I was, I was inside my home directory. The home directory still existed. I deleted everything in it. So slash home slash DT, now an empty directory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and that's like, uh, that's that's painful. <laughs> yeah, and that's the growing pains of uh, you know learning it. You know what I'm saying? It, it's it's a lot of commands out there that you can really mess up your system. Yeah, you know with so just gotta well, I quit. Use, I actually quit using the DD command uh, after like the second or third time uh, that I met, had a misstep with it. Because mm -hmm. you know, everybody has a nickname for it. They call it what the disk destroyer, disk destroyer yep. the data deleter, yep. whatever they, they call that. It has a whole bunch of different names. I never understood that until the first time I did that. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because one of the one, yeah, that's that's the main. I would say one of the main from from what I remember from the documentation because I did a video on it a while back. But that's one of the main. Um, marketed things about this that that actual program is to wipe a disk and then i think you could do it multiple times and you'll reach that dod standard or <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. you know that's one of those things i do so much stuff at the terminal mm -hmm. it's because so many of these command line applications are just fantastic I, they're oh, more yeah. convenient most of the time than the gui but when people see me on camera like flash a uh, flash something to a usb stick i pull up a program like etcher like, yeah. Why didn't you just DD? I don't trust myself with DD. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, Etcher has that built-in safety feature where it will only write to an external USB device. It won't uh, yeah. write to an you know, internal. So you can't overwrite one of your system drives, which I, I find a nice touch. Mm -hmm. yep. How often do you have to work with uh, Windows machines or Mac machines? Um, every day. I You do? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm actually a database administrator, so I work on a uh, whole bunch of Windows servers oh, okay. managing those databases, database mm -hmm. management systems. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of time on Windows Server. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. You yeah. spend probably you spend more time on Windows servers than Linux servers. Yeah, pretty much. Well, probably one oh, of yeah. the things I, I think I've gotten um, is become a little bit more where I spend m more time on both, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or the no. equivalent amount of time on both. Cause I work from, I currently work from home. So, um, yeah. So when, I'm, when you have to use windows or Mac or, you know, non Linux operating systems, do you ever find them limiting because of your experience with Linux or do you ever find them not as good in some areas? Yeah. Um, I do. I, well, I did a while back. Um, it's it's starting to get a lot better. You, you're starting to see a lot more more things in Windows that are really a benefit similar to what you would see in Linux as far as the command line. Uh, We're starting to learn from the competition. Yes. yes. It's, <laughs> essentially. Yep. Yep. Because PowerShell has, is is awesome, man. It's, it's an well, awesome little uh, scripting language for the operating system. They realized that they were losing all the developers because the bash shell and all the, the GNU core utils and all of that is so fantastic. And then for years, Windows didn't really want to have a proper terminal. Yeah. They didn't really want a proper command line experience, a proper shell. And then like, hey, you know, everybody's using this Linux thing. Why? That's why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yep. They they took from the competition. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, PowerShell is. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and you know, Microsoft obviously has become a lot more friendly regarding open sourcing a lot of their software. I think they've s seen why Linux is successful. It's, it's that open source model, really, is the, the main reason for Linux's success. Mm -hmm. No other reason. It's open source is the reason Linux is where it's at. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I agree. I agree. Uh, and that's why you, you're starting to see that. 
subset for Linux yeah. uh, on Windows, you know. And you uh, you, the Windows subsystem for Linux, is that something you play around in a lot? No, nah, I haven't I haven't really played around with it because I, I don't have a I haven't either. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I work yeah. on Windows every day, I don't have a need for it. Now I would probably see it more on a developer side. If I was a developer, you'd probably see it there. But yeah, just managing servers, remote desktop manager. <laughs> <laughs> Typically where I live. <laughs> I did want to ask you one other thing about your desktop computer use, especially on Linux. Do you game at all on Linux? Now, that's one thing I haven't uh, went back to. It's been it's been a while. I have mm -hmm. gamed in the past. I used to play League of Legends a whole lot mm -hmm. on Linux. Um, that was like one of the really the only game I would play is League of Legends. I would spin that up when I had some time and and run that on there. And I, was that a native uh, Linux game, or were you running that in Wine? Or no, nah, this was after I finally switched over to Orch. I, oh, okay. I, I was able to get it out the AUR, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I just hopped in and started playing it. Man, I got hooked on it <laughs> for a mm -hmm. while, but. I haven't recently been playing because I've always had systems. I've always had the, you know, either a PlayStation or uh, mm -hmm. Xbox at some point. So I've always played around with those those systems more uh, than yeah. on my computers. My computers, I always saw them as work. You know right. what I'm saying? Because I mm -hmm. do that every day at my normal job. I'm sitting in front of a server. Or I'm sitting in front of some computers. So that's just a change um by you know having another system and a tv i can go play with so exactly that's yeah. the thing with the consoles you can sit in front of that really nice big screen tv yeah and, <laughs> yeah, and play your first person shooter or whatever where on a computer monitor it's just not quite the same yeah yeah and i, I and and i would say i didn't i stopped playing windows yeah i stopped playing uh, regular games on a computer, like in high school or something like that. And um, I never really went back. And so I never, I, I lost my, um, you know, my, my gaming hands, so to speak, if you want to use <laughs> to call it that, how, you know, I don't know all the keys anymore. I used to know all those yeah. keys and be able to just move the mouse around like real quick. Um, but yeah, I lost all that. Cause yeah, that I can relate because I was, <laughs> and I was the same way you know, as far as my teens, or early 20s, gaming a lot. And then I just, you know what? I, I don't want to do this anymore. I just quit forever. And uh, now I'll occasionally fire up a game, like some of the open source games on Linux, some of the first person shooters like Zonotic or Sour Brighton or, you know, things like that. Play for like 10 minutes. But it's not something not like it was when you're young where you can play hours every day for like six weeks because you got to complete this big campaign in some game. Like, I, uh, I don't have time for that. Well, you got any uh, contact information that you would like to disclose? How would the people that want to get in touch with you or, you know, just check out some of your amazing content, social media? You got any uh, links? You oh, yeah, write? yeah. Keep it techie everywhere. So I'm on a lot of the social media platforms. Um, I, I am on Odyssey as well, so keep it techie over there as well, and on YouTube, of course. And you can contact me. Like one thing I do is I do a lot of mentorship where I I help younger people try to navigate the tech industry, and nice. because it's 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 difficult. When I when I was first coming in, it was no one telling me what direction to go, like what certifications to look into or what trainings to look into. I was just kind of feeling around in the dark and uh, making decisions based on the information I can gather myself. But it, it would have been great if someone was there to say, hey, you're interested in this. Well, let me tell you this about this program or let me tell you about this certification that can get you there a little bit faster instead of you, you know, fumbling. Um, so I try to do that now uh, for people that I run into either through my channel or, you know, on these various social media platforms. Um, and I do offer mentorship for free, like 50, like um, for 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Um, just quick awesome. mentorship where mm -hmm. we, we get in there and we talk straight. Hey, what are you trying to do? Let me help you 
decide on what direction to go in order to, you know, in order for you to be successful. And so that's that's one of the things I do. So if you guys are interested, you can. I always post it every now and then on my channel. Um, Just hit me up and I I try to help people with that. That is Incredible, Josh. Not only do you provide some fantastic content on YouTube, you're just genuinely a good guy. So, Appreciate <laughs> it. Given, a, given that free time like that, that is amazing because uh, and there's not too many people like that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for that. And thank you for talking to me today. Uh, and best of luck to you as far as your channel and all your endeavors and work and life. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks, right, Thanks, Josh. All, all right. right. Peace. Bye bye.